Hello, my name's Andrew Zeminski, and I'm the uh, author of The Stonemason, uh, published by John Murray's just before lockdown. Uh, I carved this cover myself. It's uh, 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 whip it, nutmeg. I was pretty rubbish at school, so I thought I would go in a direction that would allow me to engage with my historical interests in a sort of practical way, and a way that would actually allow me to earn a, earn a living. So stonemasonry it was. I used to volunteer a lot as a teenager, working on archaeological digs, Iron Age hill forts, and medieval undercrofts, that sort of thing. And I was just some, you know, doofus, spotty kid hanging around trying to be useful. I learned about traditional materials, uh, working with my hands, craft. And then I um, went to Weymouth College, just over there, and learned my craft as a stonemason. I think you get to a stage in your life where you start to look over your shoulder, don't you? So I sort of hit, I was approaching 50 and my parents passed away and uh, I had a little bit of money and I thought, right, I'm just gonna sit down and record what, what I have experienced. And I remember thinking that, you know, I do read a lot and all the books I read about the past are written by academics and journalists. Working people don't write books and I sort of struggle with that. Why is that? So I thought I'd have a bash. <laughs> I'm quite lucky that I've, I've worked on such a huge variety of jobs, from Neolithic long barrows, West Kennet long barrow, to the Roman baths in Bath, to Salisbury Cathedral, where I did my training. And you can't not absorb what's going on around you. In my day-to-day -day life, you mix with all sorts of folk, farmers, dukes, uh, other stonemasons, your suppliers, scaffolders, the whole, you know, spend the whole time mixing with every strata of society. There is a democracy in construction that has gone on from the earliest times, really. We are working on, uh, to repair the tomb of Sir Thomas Gainsborough. You have to take the tomb apart. He just wanted to be buried under a, a plain slab that just had his name on it. But uh, a Victorian enthusiast spent a load of money sprucing up his tomb and it wasn't very well done, really. So we picked it all apart and we took stone from here on Portland and we refurbished his tomb. But in taking it apart, he's actually, you know, he's still in there. And um, uh, he's there with his, his wife. He's in a, a lead coffin. The coffin had split and you could, you know, you could see him. So, uh, so I did reach out and touch his hand. Um, it's a bit of an odd thing to do. Portland is absolutely thick with, with wildlife. You know, there are slow worms and glow worms around here at night, and peregrine falcons and ravens flying around. The quantity of insect life here is extraordinary, and you get, because Portland juts out into the English Channel, you get these processions of migrating birds. It's just, you know, there's certain times of the year, this is just the very best place to observe the, the, the natural world in, in movement. Part of that is the barrenness of this place. You know, you look down this coast, it's all industrial waste. It's all spoil that's been tipped off the edge. And that's created this sort of wholly new landscape where people can't really go. Absolutely love that. And you can see how nature is, has really benefited. No Portland, no City of London, no St Paul's, no Banqueting House, no Buckingham Palace. You know, Portland gave its heart for London the locals say. The Isle is often regarded as down at hill, industrial and weird. Here, the Jurassic coastline plays tricks. Where the beach meets the island, the cobbles are as big as flattened turnips and have graded down evenly to pea gravel by the time West Bay is reached. A lobster fisherman who hunts his quarry from one of the last boats to still work the bay once told me that if he landed his boat in the fog, he would know exactly where he was by the size of the shingle. The tools I use normally are, you know, mallet and chisel, but now that's been, these have been largely replaced. I'm not on the tools as much as I used to be, but I, you know, I'm getting arthritic, my shoulders going, and it's not, you know, it's, uh, it's a job for a younger person. These have been replaced with my MacBook, 
and I get two days writing out of a MacBook um, when I come here. But I just write everywhere. I write on a church pew, I write up, a, a, up the top of a tower. It's always in my backpack. Getting into, you know, into my 50s, and all my friends are in decline mentally. <laughs> and, I, and I'm on the up because I'm learning, you know, this, writing this book is my degree, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've not looked back.